All right, y'all. Bless up, bless up. Job power. See, what we got to do is go deep off into these studies. We can't just walk around wearing, yo, the onks and the dashikis and, you know, all of, we got to study the arts and the sciences of it. And the origin begins in the Nile Valley. There's no other origin to this. We have to, all 42 tribes, the major tribes of Africa in the ancient world used to live in the Nile Valley. So what happened in the rest of Af Africa, the records are in the Nile Valley, on the wall, on the papyrus, on the scrolls. So we have to go deep into these books. Go home. We have to go. We got to go deep into these books because it don't make no sense for you to go and you don't know what you're looking at. So you could go, you know, and they could tell you anything. And you take a little tour guide or something, and he could tell you anything. But you want to have a, a for sure reference to know what you're looking at. And that's what we're going to do tonight. So we got to get more interested, not just in the culture. We must get learn the languages of the ancient people. And that's what the scientists do. And they hand that shit to the people that rule the world. And that's, just, that's just how they're able to keep in control of the world. This is how they're able to do it. they not, where do you think they get this information from? They follow the ancients. Because the ancient civilizations lasted longer than theirs. And what they are trying to do is to get their civilization to last at least a fraction of that. You got civilizations easy, at least 10,000 years old. The Sphinx go to 12,050 B.C. So, obviously, the people had to be here to build the Sphinx. You see what I'm saying? You know, so the Sphinx is an old monument. It's older than the pyramids. You see, in this, in this hundreds of pyramids between Egypt, Ethiopia, Sudan, it's from all the way in, oh, you know, in Nigeria, Ile Ife. A lot of people don't talk about their part of the night. You see what I'm saying? The Ile Ife people. If you study them, they got it, got it all right there. You see what I'm saying? The whole now Valley, 4,000 miles long, you know, the, the Egyptian was a great record keeper. They kept these records so, you know, in times in the future so people can use them. But the powers of those records are in the hands, are not in the hands of the rightful owners, which are African people of African descent. So the Egyptologists, like Thomas Young, that came before, before Sean Pelion, you know, and then the ones that came before him couldn't speak it. They can't speak it, but they couldn't speak it. They looked at it as, as a symb symbolic language, you know, that couldn't be spoken. So they got frustrated uh, after a while and just left it alone. They just didn't keep going into, you know, trying to put letters on symbols because they didn't look at it like that. They was looking at it as something mysterious and all of this going on. And, um, you know, Blooming Bop, he was one of the Egyptologists that came before. Um, um, Amherst, he was one of the Egyptologists that came before. Um, so you could even say Napoleon, Napoleon was the one that set all of this up. He did the, uh, the Battle of the Pyramids, the, you know, it was a war that he had with the British and the French, and they was fighting over who was going to own this Rosetta Stone. You see what I'm saying? Anything that they got in those museums are spoils of war. Even our ancestors that they got in the museum are spoils of war. So they don't, you know, whenever a, a war is fought, the prize ain't just the land, it's the uh, culture of the land is being took. Usually they uh, destroyed a lot of statues, you see what I'm saying? But the stuff, you know, once they realize the power of it, of it they stop destroying it and start keeping it and start reading what the ancients knew so they can make this civilization go a lot longer. You see what I'm saying? To get, you know, maybe to a thousand years. America ain't but 500. America is the new ancient Egypt of the day. 
You see what I'm saying? Ancient Egypt is like Miami, uh, New York, California, you know, and Puerto Rico all bundled in one. I'm saying like, you know, it's like the the best part where everybody want to be. You know what I'm saying? It's like the Hollywood, you see what I'm saying, of that day where the educational system was. Like today, everybody want to come to the U.S. and learn and get a job and be able to be prosperous in life. Well, that's what the Nile Valley was and the ancient world. You see what I'm saying? But we have to get off into these languages. Anything that we want to learn is on this Internet. This Internet is a, a true, true weapon of education. You see what I'm saying? Uh, the best education is self-education. You see? But we got to get off into these, you know, these nettles. We got to get off into all our ancient languages. Because these nettles is where all of the alphabets came from. Without these letters, wouldn't know, the Greeks wouldn't be able to give you Greek language, and then you wouldn't be able to have Latin, and you wouldn't be able to have French and English and Spanish and, you know, Coptic and all these. You wouldn't be able to have all, none of those religions and none of those ways of speaking if it wasn't for these nettles. And these nettles came from in Africa, and it came from watching the animals. It came from watching the animals. That's why, you see, the animals, the zoomorphic type animals, you know, portray as, uh, you know, some of the symbols and things like that. So we're going to get into this tonight. I want to thank y'all for logging on. Yo, and I'm coming right back. Y'all peek this out. I'm going to show y'all. We're going to go uh, uh, to these early Egyptologists. Let's go. Finally, reveal its clues. In 1802, Sylvester de Sassi of France and Johann Ackerblatt of Sweden were the first to throw out the ideas of the past and try a fresh approach. They looked at Egyptian hieroglyphs and said, other civilizations write in perfectly normal ways. Um, I don't see why the Egyptians have to be different. They looked also at other documents from Egypt, not simply temples, obelisks and hieroglyphs, but things on papyrus, paper documents. And they said rightly, look, the Egyptians had perfectly good ways of writing perfectly ordinary everyday letters. Maybe all of their writing system is rational after all. De Sassi and Dr. Bland followed the premise that the demonic language used a Western system of writing. They took a number of recurring Greek words, including the pronouns he or his, and the word Greek. They then searched the demonic text for words which repeated in roughly the same locations. They verified that wherever these words occurred in Greek, they appeared in a similar pattern in the demonic. What these pioneers did was to begin to prove that the script was not just a symbolic script, that there were signs that meant individual letters, stood for individual letters. We no longer looked at it as something esoteric and full of hidden meaning. Although their first step at translating the demonic text was somewhat promising, de Sassi and Ackerblad gave up, having failed to crack the hieroglyphic code. Three years after the Rosetta Stone's discovery, opening the window onto Egypt's secrets was proving to be far more complex than anyone had thought. The greatest minds of Europe were beginning to think the mysteries of Egypt would stay hidden forever. Following de Sassi and Akerblad's attempt, more than a decade passed without any further serious efforts. Although the public's fascination with ancient Egypt continued to grow, the Rosetta Stone was all but forgotten. For those thinking of trying to decipher the hieroglyphs, the failure of de Sassi and Ackerblad proved an intimidating legacy. There was a, a feeling, as with most decipherments, that it's a big prize, but also a big risk. You could end up covering yourself with glory, and you could end up making a really big fool of yourself. Now, scholars are, by temperament, rather cautious. And it takes a certain kind of person to say, I don't care if I make a fool of myself. I'm going to have a go at this. Up next, the race heats up again. 
as a wealthy scientist from England battles a young, obsessed French scholar to find the key. Meet the British genius who decided to spend his summer vacation decoding the Rosetta Stone. How did he become the first to read the hieroglyphs? Also, discover the legend surrounding a sorcerer's prediction that a small town boy would be the one to bring light to the past. What I'm showing y'all is the foundation of Egyptology. That don't mean that that's the African spirit to, you know, to the ancient elders. That means that we're giving a foundation so we can understand, so the people can understand where this is coming from. But what I'm saying is, this is where your Christianity comes from. This is where a lot of your Islam comes from. This is the way it's got a lot of your Judaism come from. You see what I'm saying? Because the brothers brought up a good point. How does Amen? How does Ta'aka? How does Ramesses? How does, um, uh, what's the, uh, Shabaka? How do those names end up in the Bible that was written in 1611? And those words, Shabaka, Amen, those were in disciples until, seven, until the end of the 1700s. That means what was in the 1611 Bible, you got it from somewhere else. Now I'm going to show y'all where the Catholic Church was against Sean Pelion, you know, discovering, you know, the demonic text to what the language that the common man spoke, not the, the top piece. They ain't discovered that yet. They ain't, you know, uh, you know, bringing it to the light yet. They ain't bringing it to the forefront yet. You know what I'm saying? Because that's the sacred languages of the ancient priests. That's why those are pictorial. Now, the other ones that they don't put the letters to, some of those letters don't match. And I'm going to show you all that. Too. I'm going to show you all that, too, where they had to uh, add vowels into it. And if you add vowels, that makes it English. A, E, I, O, and U are not in the nether. They're not in the nether. All of it. That's why when you spell out Ra, it's an actual word, R-A. So we know they got that one right. We know they got that one right. Now, Ray is Coptic. When you say sun rays, the sun rays shine on me, Ray is Coptic. That's what it was called about 2 o'clock. Ra was in when it was at 12 o'clock in its zenith at its height. The sun is speaking about. See, Christianity is sun worship. I'm, we ain't going to get into that right now because that's not what this is about. But what I'm saying is we know they got that one right. But, I'm, you know, you've seen, you know, Serlingham and Yon, they had done gave up on it because they figured it couldn't be spoken. You see what I'm saying? They had done got the little demotic and figured out a way, but they couldn't even get that far. So they just had done let it go. And I'm going to show y'all Thomas Young. He gonna be the one really to set it off. You see what I'm saying? But all that came before that was Napoleon with those, you know, those wars and with the British over there in Egypt. See, they all these people that's in power, these world power people of history, all of the Greeks and the Romans and the British and the, you know, French, you know, Russia and you know the Jews, all of these people are obsessed with ancient Egypt. Madame Lavosky are fucking obsessed. You see what I'm saying? A lot of them talking about they oracles where they talking to the ancient Egyptians themselves. That's what Champelion mom, y'all gonna look this up. Champelion mom said that her son, that she had a dream, you know, a vision that while she was sleeping that the ancestors, the uh, ancient Egyptian ancestors came to her. To who the book of thought came to her and told her her son was going to be the right one to unlock these keys to these secret language, the, the nether, you know, the glyphs, the hieroglyphs. You see what I'm saying? So, and, you know, he grew up poor, you know what I'm saying? He grew up studying languages. He uh studied oriental languages, you know what I'm saying? Before that, you know what I'm saying? Um, He was more, he was, he, he was more into to those languages until he laid his eyes on these ancient Egyptian languages. He let all of that go and spent his whole life trying to figure these languages out. But without Thomas Young, he wouldn't have never figured out the demotic. The demotic, again, is the one uh, y'all going to see I'm going to have blow, blowed up uh, uh, in the middle 
on on on, on another part, but um, you gonna see it. I'm gonna have it blow up. But um, the next uh, uh, uh one to come was Sean Pelion, and he was a Freemason. Uh, a lot of the uh, 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 Egypt early Egyptologists was Freemasons. A lot of uh, the early Egyptologists were also Ashkenazi Jews. Ashkenazi means German. That's what the word Ashkenazi means. But I'm going to show y'all how all of these languages are connected to these netters. You see what I'm saying? Without the netters, you have no alphabet. I'm going to show y'all. It was a problem, an unsolved mystery, and he wanted a chance to crack it. Young began by concentrating on the words graphically. He located lines in the Greek text which had words occurring more than once. He then attempted to find lines in the demonic text, which had groups of symbols repeated these same numbers of times. Using this matching system, Young was systematically able to identify 86 demonic translations, including the words King, Ptolemy, and Egypt. Where Desasi and Ackerblatt had stopped, Young's initial success led him to continue his efforts. Egyptologists had long been fascinated by the hieroglyphs that were surrounded by ovals. Called cartouches, they seemed to be placed strategically in and around the temples and tombs. A few Egyptologists had begun to speculate that a cartouche contained the name of a pharaoh or member of the royal family. Young used this knowledge to work on the theory that the cartouches on the Rosetta Stone would contain the name Ptolemy. The tablet was honoring him, so his name should be in the cartouches in the hieroglyphic section. Young further surmised that because Ptolemy was a Greek name, the Egyptians would have to write his name phonetically. If the hieroglyphs were pictorial, they would not contain symbols for foreign names or words. Four years after he began, Young correctly matched the Greek letters in the name Ptolemy with the hieroglyphs inside one of the cartouches. In 1818, he was the first one to cause the stone to speak. The hieroglyphic section had spoken its first word, Ptolemy. While his success was beginning to garner the public's attention across the English Channel in France, another man had already been obsessed with the deciphering of the Rosetta Stone. A man Young would initially encourage, then later regret having helped at all. Thomas Young's work was well known, uh, not only in England, but also in other countries. What's more, he sent copies of his work to various scholars up and down the continent, and particularly to Paris. And copies of Young's work were sent to Sylvester de Sassy. One day, de Sassy showed a copy of Young's work to a young Frenchman, and the name of the Frenchman was Jean-Francois Champollion. Jean-Francois Champollion's destiny seemed tied to the Rosetta Stone from birth. French legend describes how his bedridden mother was visited by a sorcerer months before Jean-Francois was born. Looking into the eyes of this sickly woman, the sorcerer saw the past being connected with the future. He predicted this woman's unborn son would be the one to bring light onto the centuries of the past. Champollion was born in Figeac, France, 1790, to a small town bookseller. When he was 11, living in a boarding school in Grenoble, news of Napoleon's expedition to Egypt captured the imagination of France. Champollion's older brother, Jacques Joseph, read tales of Egypt's glories and mysteries to his younger brother. When the younger Champollion received a copy of the Rosetta Stone from a cousin who had traveled to Egypt as part of the expedition, he was hooked. Young Jean-Francois made it his goal to read the hieroglyphs, and that of course meant cracking the Rosetta Stone. All his early training was devoted with that in mind. He soon paid little attention to his other studies. Languages were his all-consuming obsession. His studies became focused on Oriental and Middle Eastern languages, especially Coptic. Coptic had been a language spoken by Christians in Egypt and written in Greek. When he was about 14, Champollion uh, was working far too hard 
uh, not on his schoolwork, but on Egyptian hieroglyphics. And he had what nowadays I think would be called a, a minor nervous breakdown. And he was sent off to recover. And he wrote a letter back to his elder brother saying, it's so boring here, send me a Chinese grammar. That was the kind of obsessive personality that Champollion was. Champollion's early studies focused on the deciphering of the demonic language and its relation to Coptic. He had previously believed that hieroglyphs were symbolic, that they were mysterious and could not be deciphered in an ordinary way. But at about the same time as Young, Champollion began to sense the same links between the Greek names and the hieroglyphic cartouches. When reports of Thomas Young's work reached him, Champollion realized in a flash they were correct. Like this one. This one is Cleopatra. I'm going to show you how they done it. You see the A, these two birds, these is the A. Right here, these are the two A's. This is a C. The lion is the L. The O. This little loaf of bread looking thing right here is the T. And you see this right here is the R. You see? This is the R. So that's Cleopatra. You need to see it spell out and see if I can take it. See? That's who that is right there. And that's how he done it. But what he done, let me show you the, let, let, let me show you the stone. That's clear. Let me show you the stone. Now this Rosetta stone right here on this Ptolemy, this Ptolemy over here. That's the first one they done. But y'all see the cartouche is going this way. So this way uh, will be the way you read it. This way. So, but on this bottom, they took the Greek and they followed back um, the words that were similar from all three of these. The Demotic, the Egyptian, and then the Greek on the bottom, Demotic in the middle, and the Egypt, ancient Egyptian on the top. But the one right here is also Egyptian, the one in the middle. And the one in the middle they used to, because um, they already knew the Greek. So they took the Greek and just like told me, hold on, let's go. See if we can try. So y'all can see it written down, cause it, it'd be easier for, uh, for me and you. Okay, that's totaling me right there. Y'all can see this, right? That's totaling me right there. So if you grab this one, hold on. If you grab this one. I'm trying to get both on where you can see them. Okay. All right. There you go. Boom. See, let's see how I can see this here. Boom. There you go. All right. Let's do told me right here. Okay. You see this right here? This is the, again, you gotta read it from this way, cause the, uh, faces are facing this way. So this is, this is so called P right here, but it ain't no P. It's T, O, T, O, L, again, that lion, the L, You go to E, M, let's see, let's find the M over here and slow down, which is this, it'll be this right here on this one. It'll be the M right here on this one. Okay, that's the M right here. 
Mm -hmm. And look at the, the Y. All right. Let's see if we can get it. It's these two. Here go the Y. Right here. Is it the two feathers? Is there a Y? And that's telling me that's that's how he used to do it. But the the one on the top right here only got fourteen sentences. So I was going in trying to see which one did he use from this one to get this one. Because this one is the, the one from the middle. This Ptolemy right here is the Egyptian one from the middle. And then this say Ptolemy right here. And obviously it's a Ptolemy up here too. You see what I'm saying? Now I got the other Ptolemy glyph. But we're going to do one more. Let's do one more. Let's do one more. So we did Ptolemy. Let's, okay, I know what we can do. I know who we can do. Let's do, let's see. Let's do. Right. Some of y'all already know this, but we got to keep going over this. Because, you know, everybody don't know. The majority of the people don't know this right here. So we got to do it. Okay. Yeah, boom. You blow it up a little bit. Boom. Now this one. Alright. Now this one is Ramesses. Ramesses the second. Alright. Let's go ahead. Let's do it. Alright. With an R. Here. Here's the R. Ra. The, the bird in the middle. That's Ra. This is mess, which is Coptic, which is Coptic. So they done had to go somewhere else to get this symbol, which is an ancient Egyptian symbol. And they, and, and, and this is mean, this mean niece, meaning, uh, born again or reborn. So, so you got Ra, Mess, and S is, okay, here go to E's. Find the E over here. Boom. There go the E right there. So, that's Ramesses. Let's see. Spell this, spell it out one time. Hold on, see if we can get a click on it. That's how they got it. This is what they say right there. Okay, family. This is the Rosetta Stone. Found in 1799. And here goes Champelion, the guy that they said, you know, discovered the sacred writing of the metal net of the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian sacred writing. He is. So we're going to look at the method that he used to get to this writing. This is the Rosetta Stone. On the bottom, it got Greek. Hope y'all can see it. See the, the clicker. But it got Greek on the bottom, Demotic in the middle, which is Egyptian, and ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs on the top. So what Thomas Young done first, Thomas Young was an Egyptologist preceding Champollion. But he gave Champollion some papers to get to this point. But Thomas Young, this is Ptolemy. It's spelled P-T-O-L-E-M-Y. And this is the first glyph right here that they, you know, deciphered in the metal nail, the ancient Egyptian language. So, let's see if we can, um, we're going, I'm going to show you all the methodology that he used, that, that Thomas Young used to get to this point. But I want to remind y'all, this man, he never went to Egypt, uh, uh, Champagnon never went to Egypt. That's why he needed Thomas Young's work to get it going, because the previous Egyptologist that preceded Thomas Young 
you used to think which would be more accurate to the ancient Egyptian, that the ancient Egyptian language is not phonetical, which means you can't put alphabets on it for it to be spoken. So the Egyptologist that preceded Thomas Young couldn't never decipher it. But this is the way that they use, you know, to decipher what we got today. I'm going to show you. Okay. This is, you see the lion on top. And so you see that you can read the nettles from bottom to top, whichever way the face is, is facing, that's the way, which way you read. Okay? So the, the lion is L. This symbol right here is O. This is, let's see, C. This is the E here. This is another A. The hand, let's see, is the D. The square is the P. And the, this right here is the O. If you see this letter right here, this is the R, and this right here is the T. So this is Cleopatra right here. The origins of the world. That's what's fascinated me ever since I was a boy. It's a word itself. When I first learned Latin, I thought that was it. But I kept a big Greek version for about a year. When that didn't provide the answers, so I went to Hebrew. I'd like to tackle Aramaic while I'm here. Can you imagine actually speaking the same language as our law? I can. And I do, by the way. So many questions I've always wanted to answer. What language did Adam speak? Which is the oldest race in the world, and if Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, why are they not an Egyptian in his native tongue? I'm not sure that's something we need to put. I know I can discover all the answers if I can just translate hyphen.